Hi, my name is Renya. Uh, I use they them pronouns, and this is Come Together Counseling YouTube channel. Um, in these videos, I'll be discussing healing, relationships, and the mental health field all through an anarchist lens. So while you might connect with my approach, please remember uh, we don't have a personal or therapeutic relationship. I'm just a person making videos. You find them helpful. Today's video is going to be me sharing my reflections on this book, I'm Glad My Mom Died by Jeanette McGurdy. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna share a little bit about the book and why I thought it might be a good idea to make this video. Then we'll get into some themes and then some frameworks. So this book has been talked about a lot um, online a little while ago, sort of got out of the discourse conversations more lately as its moment in the spotlight has faded. But for a time, a lot of people were talking about really Jean Jeanette's provocative statements in the title of being glad her mom had died and this sort of underlying belief in our society that on the one hand, parents are unable to be critiqued, you should be grateful for your parents, respect all these things. And then on the other hand, people saying, you know, I was harmed by my parents and this has been really helpful to see someone speak out about their experiences. So, that was sort of the conversation, at least the crux of the conversation that I'm coming into this with. And I wanted to share some more of my thoughts, see where that goes. So a little bit about the book. Jeanette was in many ways defined by her experiences as a young actress. She started acting from the age of six. And that was in large part um, out of necessity in that her family struggled financially. And this was one way to address that. And so from the age of six, her most well-known role, which for the sake of transparency, I will share, I did watch her in this role while I was much younger. She was well-known for the role of Sam and iCarly. And acted in a spin-off after that and then some other things here and there and is no longer acting due to some of the experiences she talks about in the book. Her mom was sort of very controlling, violating of any perception of boundaries, which it seems like was difficult for her to have in this relationship. Jeanette, difficult for her to have boundaries in this relationship. Um, and that I'm referring specifically to pieces around body and eating disorder related things. And then at some point, uh, her mom dies. And this sort of gives Jeanette the space to focus on figuring out who she is on uh, healing from her eating disorder and starting to set boundaries in other relationships. So that's heading in, an overview. So next I want to get into some themes. Our first theme is going to be celebrity. So how did she become a celebrity? Uh, she describes in the book that that was something her mom really enjoyed and wanted for her was to be this star. And that it wasn't so much something she wanted, um, Jeanette, but that her mom was in a way able to live vicariously through her. And at the same time, you know, the family received benefits from that financially. So it was tied up with expectations, but also with survival. So it was sort of a lot of different things at the same time. In theory, 
To be famous is to be seen and heard and to have the capacity to be your authentic self and for other people to praise you. That's not usually how it works. There's a lot of pressures on people in positions of fame or notoriety in terms of their image and how they present and what their fans come to expect from them. And in particular, there's a lot of pressures on someone who is still growing up, still learning about themselves, still building relationships and understanding the world. It can very much change a young person's perspective to be brought into that from a young age. People in these positions are objectified and idolized, in some cases made objects of worship. It can be very detrimental to someone's self-development to be thrust into celebrity status. And it also isolates young people from their peers, from the people that they would otherwise be spending time around. And that's something that she talks about is, on the one hand, being sort of isolated in that way, and then on the other hand, like how her Mormon identity plays into that with being, I think she used the word like second rate Mormon, where didn't quite fit in with the people who were doing all the right things, didn't quite fit, fit in with people who were not Mormon. So growing up very isolated and that that is very connected to being a celebrity. In our society, celebrity worship can be thought of as like putting people on this pedestal, looking at them as these objects that we use to have conversations and to talk about, sort of in the way I'm doing now a little bit. Um, but hopefully I'm not. Hopefully this is not objectifying this conversation, but that's also not always for me to determine. But I think more generally that this idea of celebrity worship is almost a replacement for community in the sense that, you know, if there were an interconnected community that there would be people that we all knew that we would talk about and sort of learn from them. And that would take the place of all of our conversations about celebrities. And also I think a replacement for religion in the sense that these are these idols, these figures that we put so much faith into and that we have these like big emotional experiences that so much is caught up in the myth, the mythology of the celebrity that being brought into that is very disorienting. So what can happen is sort of what happens with um, her own experience. So the next theme is her history of mental health struggles and having had an eating disorder. I'll start with the eating disorder. Now, in my personal and professional experience, what I've seen, what I have come to understand is that when people struggle with eating, that is really about a sense of control, like feeling control in a situation, because when you have very little control over most anything else, you at least have the physical capacity to eat or not eat. Or if you're being, if your agency is being taken away in that way, then that will also lead to problems down the line, right? So it really has everything to do with power and control and agency. That's where this is, is rooted in. So her eating disorder for her is connected to initially her bond with her mom in the sense that this is connected to celebrity. So as a child actor, if you're a little bit older, but you look younger, you're more likely to get booked for those roles because if you're a little older, you can re recite lines maybe a little bit better, you have more control over your emotions, you can stay on set longer, 
it's much easier for people to have, say, like an eight or a nine-year-old playing a five-year-old rather than an actual five-year-old playing a five-year-old. That's one example. But so when Jeanette started to experience puberty, that was the moment where she was like, oh no, something is going to change. And she went to her mom and said, because she had a feeling that this is something her mom would want. She said, can we make this stop? And so that was how her mom introduced her to controlling eating and controlling intake of food. And so it was this um, very shaky boundaries sort of thing where they did this together and it was a way of disconnecting from self, disconnecting from body and really putting all of her sense of self into this relationship with her mom out of necessity. Um, both financial necessity as well as emotional necessity in terms of being in that family. And then you can see down the line that that's something that stays with her as a coping mechanism is controlling eating when life feels uncontrollable. Connected to that is also developing alcohol, which is a way to numb our feelings if we're drinking alcohol. Um, someone who's never taught or doesn't know how to feel big feelings or really overwhelming feelings, alcohol can be a way of making those feelings shrink down to a more manageable size. So it makes sense alcohol as a tool for coping. And I just want to talk about the connection also with disability, which is that some people see alcohol use or an eating disorder as a form of disability. I, I think the connection that I just want to draw is that these things are not biologically predetermined that someone is just more likely to do because that's just who they are. But it's more so a result of being in an emotionally volatile environment and not having the skills to, and this isn't just individual skills, this is like community support too, like learning from your community how to navigate these challenging emotions and being supported by other people to then knowing what safety feels like in your body and being able to return to that feeling when you're alone. That's something we have to learn in relationships first and foremost. So in the absence of that, that is often where these things can come in is using eating, disordered eating or alcohol as a way to navigate these big feelings. And then the connection with that is that also we can develop actual physical disabilities similarly as a result of challenging navigating big emotions that can also impact our body not just our mind because they're connected right so that felt very relevant for me to bring up and th the next connected piece of that is how this is an intergenerational process right so she mentions how her mom had picked these ways of surviving up having been growing up with Jeanette's grandma. So this is how these ways of survival get passed down is in a volatile environment, people pick up ways of survival that are their only real way that they see that's available to them. And those things get passed down, whether that's directly taught, like how her mom taught her to control her eating, or in less direct ways, such as dismissing feelings through words or the stories we tell. So I also wanted to talk specifically about the way that the mental health system let Jeanette down because there are a few critiques of the mental health system that I think are coming up for me as I had read this book. So it, the book was told in very short vignettes 
that were a few pages long each for the most part. And they sort of are these like moments, something happens and then we move a little into the future. There's a moment and another thing happens. So with the mental health system involvement, I'll be referencing these specific vignettes where these things were happening. So from my perspective, the first time that the mental health system let her down was in vignette number 25. And this was when she was sort of just starting puberty and had just been on the eating disorder for a little bit of time. And the nurse that she saw spoke with her mom privately to ask about her eating. And what that nurse eventually, and, and the nurse didn't really speak privately with Jeanette to ask what was going on, but essentially told her mom, hey, make sure you're watching what she's eating. Make sure she's doing the right things and you know, here's a wink and a nudge. I know you'll do the right thing because you're her mom. Well, um, if that nurse had spoken privately with Jeanette in a non-judgmental manner and had said, what's going on? What's your eating look like? How long has it looked this way? Like, what does a typical meal look like for you? Just these sort of open-ended questions. That nurse would have discovered that mom is in on it. And this suggestion to her mom of essentially surveil her, police her behavior, you know, watch her, make sure she's doing what she's supposed to be doing. That reinforces the absolute authority that parents have over their young people, and it excuses the harm that adults can have in the lives of their young people. So while you could say that this isn't the mental health system's involvement directly, it's more of the healthcare system, I think this is where the mental health system could have initially entered into the lives of, you know, one of them, both of them, the whole family, and could have made a difference earlier on if there had been an understanding of power and control in family systems. So that didn't happen. So the whole thing got sort of swept under the rug. Much later, Jeanette has her show that she gets well known for, iCarly. She does a spinoff called Sam and Cat. She goes, I think, to um, Toronto. It's Toronto or Vancouver, where there's like another production that she meets this man who is um, part of the production and they end up developing a relationship. And part of what he shares with her is, oh, I'm really worried about you because of he had been seeing some of the purging that she had been doing and he encourages her to see a therapist. So the therapist that she starts to see, her name is Laura and this is vignette number 70. Laura, uh, Laura had very poor boundaries. If you recall earlier what I had been discussing with regards to celebrity, Laura appeared to me to be completely enamored of Jeanette's celebrity status to the extent that she used her access to Jeanette to say, hey, you're going to this event. I know there's going to be a lot of celebrities there. There's this food buffet. Why don't you take me as your guest so that we can talk about whatever is coming up for you with when there's all this food. And during this crucial moment where Jeanette was really in distress, she found her therapist was just enraptured in conversation with some other celebrity and really felt let down by that. I think also in terms of poor boundaries, that she, they may have been like texting and calling regularly and seeing each other every day or like very regularly, um, also charging her a lot of money. And overwhelmingly, I just get the sense like Laura used Jeanette's vulnerability to get access to some of the perks of being a celebrity. And really it strikes me as being very unethical behavior on her part. And 
you know, shortly thereafter, Jeanette stops seeing her, and it's no, no, what's the word? No doubts as to why, from my opinion. A little while later, she tries again in vignette number 78 with this other therapist named Jeff. Uh, Jeff is a little bit better. He is maybe a little more confident in boundaries and pretty sure of himself in certain ways. Um, it, he maybe has some history with working with eating disorders and has her do some worksheets. And she has some amount of success from a behavioral standpoint. Like, it really strikes me that this is a behavioral perspective. And what I will say about behaviorism is that it is effective in some ways in terms of addressing the surface level of a behavior that's not working for whatever reason. Behaviorism really doesn't often get to the root cause of an issue. So the sort of piece I had been talking about with power and control, it seems like that, it, it, it wasn't so much about that, it was much more like, let's keep track of this, let's manage that, let's, you know, let's obsess over the details so we don't see the roots, where things are coming from. So, you know, I wouldn't say that it's like a complete negative. I would say there are pieces that are missing from that approach. And seems like she she did appreciate it in some way so I will just say that um, I'm not a big fan of behaviorism I don't like it I wanted to talk next about family and love and how these two things sort of interact with each other so the piece I mentioned earlier about intergenerational transmission is connected to something called intergenerational trauma. That is essentially the process whereby someone has trauma in a family or in a community environment and that trauma impacts their behavior, their way of being in relationships with others, it impacts their ability to sort of like make a living and be a stable source of emotional support for young people who need that in order to feel okay in their own self. So it's very easy because our society is not very supportive of people. It's very easy for intergenerational trauma to sort of build up down the line. And again, I really do want to place the blame not on the people who are in this cycle or in this process, and instead on the society that allows things like uh, house insecurity, um, food insecurity, all of these things to happen because that is what caused the motivation to push Jeanette into becoming a celebrity in this specific context. So the intergenerational trauma piece connects with the eating disorder, it connects with poverty, also it connects with sort of her mom and dad's conflict. They had a good amount of conflict, a lot of conflict that would result in uh, shouting and throwing things and, you know, not sleeping in the home on the part of her dad. And that what that does is that is a young person's primary basis for their future intimate relationships. So if you learn that this is what a relationship looks like, is there's a lot of conflict, there isn't really repair happening, people are not really emotionally connecting in, in a particular way, that that also is what you come to expect. And that is how this process can repeat. And the other piece I will mention is Jeanette's role as a child or a young person caretaker of the adults in her life. This was something that she felt she needed to do and she learned very early was to manage her mom's emotional reactivity because her mom wasn't able to manage her own big emotions. And so Jeanette learned, if I do this, I can do this, or if I do this, I'll get this outcome from her. If I respond in this way, I will get that outcome. And to just like pick up on these little cues of like, oh, this is what this, like, like if 
she is using this phrase or if this her tone in their voice. Now, if you also have been a child caretaker, this is like probably sounding really familiar because this is something a lot of us um, have had to do is picking up on these specific things and then learning to respond in specific ways to ensure our own physical safety. But emotionally, we're all focused on them. So our emotions are second class. They don't get any attention. And this is also very connected back with celebrity, is her ability to act from a young age didn't come from nowhere, right? I mean, there were acting classes, but at the same time, also, she had to act every day in a way that would manage her mom's emotions. So, yeah, so that is very connected. Being a child caretaker, having to take on this role, this face of, like, managing other people was something that she had to do. And also, I think she talked about that with the creator of the main show she was in. The next piece I want to talk about is specifically her relationship with her mom. So in this relationship, Jeanette learned to give up her sense of self and to prioritize her mom's unbearable anxiety over her own feelings, to prioritize taking care of her mom's anxiety. And people may be familiar with the term mother wound. In our society, there's expectations or like cultural gender roles of sort of what mother and father mean connected to patriarchy, yes. Um, so this is less of a statement of what ought to be and rather like sort of how things play out instead which is that from a mother, there are these things expected, which is a sense of being taken care of and being loved and being able to pursue a sense of self-actualization because you have a sense of security in the world. Um, and if our mom doesn't provide that, then we have this thing called the mother wound. And that's like very common for people to have because uh, patriarchal expectations are ridiculous and connected to all of these things of like, it's not really something one person can do. And so, hence, we're left with this mother wound that is connected to like the unbearable expectations placed on mothers. And that feels very connected with sort of what this relationship with her mom would have been like, is that there's this wound connected to not just her specific relationship with her mom, but this archetype of the mother. How does this play out in romantic love, romantic relationships? Those shaky boundaries I had mentioned earlier, that gets continued into the romantic relationship. So saying like, our problems aren't just my problems and your problems, like they're co-mingling and impacting each other. We both always have to be solving each other's problems all the time. And that can sort of result sometimes in this idea of like a victim and savior dynamic and people can swap roles. Um, and what this results in is a sense of powerlessness in the victim and this compulsion to save this other person and the savior. So both of these are sort of resulting from similar family dynamics initially of um, in the victim, a sense of powerlessness, and in the savior, a sense of, like, you need to look after the emotions of another person. And you see how these things do not contradict each other. So this is why people can play both roles, one or the other, depending on their specific circumstances or some of the experiences in the relationship. And so when she talked about her relationship with this guy she met, that it sort of seemed to be playing this out of sort of both of them playing this role for each other because, and also there being a good amount of conflict because sort of like that was what they both knew and that was sort of what drew them together initially. Overall, there's just this sense of like reenacting the harm that we're used to in our intimate or romantic relationships. And to combat that, or to avoid reenacting these processes sort of requires 
uh, one, trial and error, but two, to be mindful of this process and to be sort of deprogramming what we have come to expect and to build a new sense of what relationships can look like for us. Uh, much easier said than done. So next I wanted to share some frameworks, some helpful frameworks in processing what is in this book. What are these, in processing these themes? So the first framework I want to talk about is youth liberation. And all of these frameworks are shell today. I'll probably make separate videos expanding more into them because I don't have the time to do them the full justice of what they're talking about in this particular video. But so the first one of these is youth liberation. And essentially youth liberation is about young people having agency and control over some of the decisions in their own life, about structurally reshaping society so that some of the harm caused by adult supremacy over young people is not able to happen. So in this context, and also how this would be connected to other forms of liberation too. It's not isolated. So in this context, what would that look like? Well, Jeanette would feel empowered to say no, and that would come from safe relationships with other people, even if her relationship with her mom theoretically is unchanged, which in this world, it would not be unchanged because it would come with these other things that would maybe make this, her mom have more space emotionally and able to process her own stuff in theory. So Jeanette having the power to say no, um, having other people in her life who are also supportive, and for their family not to be in such dire straits to begin with, right? Like, we can't really exercise our agency if we are in a state of poverty and struggling to survive. So youth liberation as being connected to survival and more general social changes such that communities can come together and support each other. So rather than keeping wealth locked up in, you know, these tiny enclaves of powerful people and their families, that it's really shared amongst everybody in a given community. And so that that means community care and community responsibility for making sure that everyone is okay. And part of that would be because children are viewed as underneath or the property of their adults. There's a whole bunch of historical reasons and context for that, but that that would be no more. That children would be their own fully autonomous young people who, yes, need some support with life experiences that they don't have because the difference between a young person and an old person is the amount of time they've been alive, right? That's the, the main difference. And so receiving support in the form of feedback and sharing of older people's own life experiences so that young people can make decisions based on what they've heard and then they can learn as they go, right? So I view that as very connected with the next framework I want to introduce, which is family abolition. Family abolition refers not to the abolition of, you know, your mom or your grandparents. It refers to the abolition of the form of family that is like the nuclear family or maybe the nuclear family and like some extended version of that. It's really about what, sort of what I have been talking about, extending networks of mutual care out beyond the immediate family, the immediate household of a society in which communities can come together and take care of each other, and in which childcare is not relegated to the private home and all of this pressure is put on, in particular, moms and mothers, but that it would be spread out and so there's more accountability with how older people interact with younger people. There would be accountability and there would be sort of the removal of all of this wealth and all of this power and all of this um, opportunity in certain higher class families, but that with abolishing families would be abolishing that sense of exclusion. 
So family abolition deeply connected to the abolition of the class structure and also to youth liberation. The last framework I want to bring up is disability justice. And the main thing I want to say about that is, you know, physical, mental, emotional, most any type of disability is very connected to this messed up society we're in and us not having the time or the space or the resources to heal, whatever that looks like for us, right? Like we're sort of left to survive on our own with very minimal supports. And, you know, if you are sort of of the belief that there's a lot of support available for disabled people, at least in the US, if, if this is your belief, I would encourage you to go watch and listen to some of the perspectives of disabled people, and I will link some below in the description, because that is absolutely not true. Um, people are fighting for scraps, and that is really messed up. So the need for resources for people to be able to heal, and how that is connected also with liberation in other senses and with other groups of people. It's all connected. So these have been the frameworks. Now I just want to talk a little bit about telling your story. So Jeanette told her story and here we are, we've been talking about it. I don't know how long this video is going to be in total, maybe 45 minutes. Um, we've been talking about her telling her story and I think there's a lot of risk involved in telling your story because some random person you don't know might sit, sit down and talk about it on YouTube for 45 minutes, and that's got to feel weird, I would imagine. Um, but I think by telling your story, especially publicly as a celebrity in the way that she has done, is that it has sparked an important conversation in the way that we are as a society, the way that things are allowed to be and like if that's okay or not. It also gives people who maybe were feeling very alone something to look at and to see I'm not alone and this isn't okay and it's my right to not want things to be this way. Right? So that's part of the benefit of telling your story, at least in a public sense. In a private sense, it's very connected with grieving, of processing your story, putting it into perspective by telling the story. And so I'm sure that she was telling the story before she told it to everybody. She told it to people who were able to listen and were able to be supportive in that moment. And that's really where the bulk of the personal benefit is in the private spaces of sharing that with people in your life who are going to support you who maybe they have their own experiences that they can relate to, or maybe they're just willing to be open to what your experiences are, and they're very open to letting you have all your feelings about it, right? Like really connecting with the anger of your relationship with your mom or whomever else, right? Being glad your mom died, you're allowed to be glad. I'm sure that's not the only feeling she was experiencing. I'm sure there's a whole lot of other feelings. Um, but would the book have gotten as much attention if she said, I'm sad, my mom died? Maybe not. Um, so part of the telling your story piece is that it's a nonlinear process of working out what happened as the way we understand ourselves change, so also the way we understand our memories will change. So it's a nonlinear process of understanding ourself and putting different pieces together. And it's almost like the more we return to it, the more new stories start to come up. And that's not easy because with it being always changing is new emotions can come up from things that we thought we already processed. And so I'm sure it was really hard for her initially when people had been talking about this, that like emotions were coming up. And I did see that she had a podcast previously that she took down. And I have to imagine that this is probably why. And I fully support that decision because, you know, that's something she made. She can take it down if she wants. Um, so 
for you, the viewer of this video, hi. Um, really, the piece, I guess, to leave here with is the power of telling your story in taking the power back from horrible things that may have happened to you, from people who may have had power over you and harmed you, or in other cases where you just feel misunderstood and you want to tell your side of the story and you want people to be able to see what was your perspective of that situation or of your life. You have the power to tell your story and I think it really has a lot of healing potential telling your story. So I want to encourage you in some type of way to do that with supportive people. It is my perspective that it is always the right of people in less power to tell the story of the person in more power who may have harmed them in some way. The people in more power will want that story to be silent, to not share that story because they don't want to confront that they might have hurt someone. Often this is the case. There are people who are open to accountability and that is great. They will not try to silence your story. But I think it is the right of everyone who has been harmed by an authority figure to tell their story. And with that, if you want to share what part of the story in this book that you can relate to, whether that's something I shared or if you have read the book or read something about it or seen something, what, what can you relate to in this story? How does it connect with your story? Thanks for watching this video. This screen's a placeholder until I start to accrue more Patreon subscribers, at which point this is where I'll say thank you. Uh, having patrons helps me to continue to make these videos, so if you feel you're getting something from them, consider becoming a patron. The Patreon is linked in the description as well as on my YouTube profile via my all my links link. Additionally, if you like this video or share your thoughts in the comments or share this video with other people who might like it, all of these things help to ensure that this video can continue to reach people who might find it helpful. Uh, if you live or work in Pennsylvania and would be interested in scheduling a consultation to talk about becoming my therapy client, uh, you can click to my YouTube page and then again click my all my links link and one of those links will be my therapy website and that's where you can contact me. Say you're coming from YouTube. And if you'd like to contact me about this channel, please use the email that is listed under my about page. Thanks for your continued support. I do deeply appreciate it. And I'll see you in the next video.